Thank you, Ann. Um, yeah, my name is Jeff Wissing. I am the Vegetation Management Supervisor for Holy Cross Energy. Holy Cross is a cooperative located in central western Colorado. We are about 40 miles north of Aspen, probably close to 60 miles west of Vail. So it puts us right smack dab in the middle of ski country. Um, we service a lot of resort towns. I have been in this position here at Holy Cross for the last seven, eight years. I started out here, this is my 30th year at Holy Cross. I started out just dragging brush and throwing it through a chipper and kind of worked my way up to the ranks to a supervisory role. That being said, I have seen pretty much everything there is to see from an operational standpoint as far as utility vegetation management. Today, I'm going to discuss a little bit about where we have been, some of the issues that we faced back then, where we are now, especially some of the issues uh, speaking to what Dr. Siebold talked about, the prolonged drought and some of the severity of these prolonged weather events that we're seeing all of a sudden, and the issues that we now face because of that. <clears throat> and then moving forward into our solutions currently and hoping to the future to where we can have sustainable efforts and sustainable uh, treatment of our of our easements and right-of-ways. So as you all know, um, the ones in the, the attendees from all the utilities, utilities use what's called a cycle-based approach. You basically start at point A and you go to point Z and it's all based on a time frame. And that time frame is decided by the area of your system, how much the terrain, the geography, the seasonal issues that affect, that affect depending on if you're high mountain or low valleys. <clears throat> and that's been an industry standard for decades. And it's worked. It's been very sustainable. What we're starting to see, though, is because of the prolonged drought and because of these severe prolonged weather events that we're starting to see, it's no longer encroachment that is really such an issue for us. It's more uh, hazard tree fallen from outside of the right of way. Um, as Dr. Siebold spoke before, the beetle infestation has reached epidemic proportions for us. Uh, last I heard, we've been a, the lodgepole forests alone have been affected at uh, about 1.4 million acres. We're seeing a lot of mid-cycle die-off in, in the aspen groves, whereas those groves are just dying over the course of a winter. So you can go in and mitigate an area, and the next summer, you might have to send crews back in to do it. It's gotten to the point here at Holy Cross that we've started to pull in extra crews and pull in extra vendors just to combat the mid-cycle die-off that we're seeing. And as the wildland urban interface increases and as people grow and come into these resort communities, that puts these areas more at risk for catastrophic wildfire events. So no longer is just using organizational system knowledge of our easements sufficient for us. Um, the rate of die-off and being able to find these trees and find these areas that need affected really creates a need for an increased and advanced situational awareness. <clears throat> Some of the current solutions that we are looking at right now, um, starting with system resiliency, we're building beefier, better systems that are more capable of being able to resist wildfire. Some of those things that we're using is SCADA control devices. I mean, we've operated a mechanical system in the utility industry for uh, well over a hundred years. And the equipment has not changed all that much over the course of those years. I mean, yes, the load has increased and transformers have gotten bigger, conductors have gotten bigger, but the actual mechanical system hasn't really changed a whole lot over the last hundred years. <clears throat> But with technology coming in, the advent of technology, we are able to use some of these things and be able to control our devices from a dispatch area, which can shut off power in a faster, quicker time frame, and hopefully cause less of a spark should some of our equipment have to operate. Because I mean, let's be let's be frank: when a piece of electric equipment operates, there is a potential for a spark. When a piece of electrical equipment fails there's even more of an opportunity for a spark. So how do we combat that? Like I said, we use SCADA control devices. We've also started looking at public safety power shutoff 
during high wind events. Some of the issues surrounding that are once the wind event has passed, you have to get crews out there to patrol the lines. That caused an interruption in service. No one likes that. I like to have my power. <clears throat> We've also started using something called non-explosive fuses. These are fuses that instead of when a normal fuse would operate, it throws <clears throat> um, a spark when the element inside burns to the ground. These non-expulsion fuses contain those gases and contain that element inside. Issues with those right now are they are 10 times more expensive than a normal fuse. Some of the supply chain issues that we are facing globally makes it more difficult to get these non-expulsion fuses. Uh, another thing that we're doing as far as system resilience is we're re-engineering our current infrastructure. We're setting bigger poles, setting stronger towers, shorter spans. We're using um, <clears throat> insulated wires such as space cable or tree wire so that just to reduce that lack of a spark. <clears throat> We've also started using here at Holy Cross, and this is just recently, I know it's, it's becoming more widespread around the nation, but we've started having access to panel cams. These are cameras with an AI capability that sit up on top of mountaintops and they are, they essentially just find smoke blooms and that can help with a quicker response as far as wildfire crews getting out there to combat the wildfire. And also just having that increased situational awareness. We've also started, really stepped up our vegetation management efforts. There has been some advances in technology in these areas. Um, remote sensing with AI capabilities is one of the things that is, I, I really see it as being the future of this industry. So using those remote sensing tools such as LiDAR, such as satellite, we are able to have that situational awareness, whereas normally mid-cycle inspections would take boots on the ground, would take almost a year or two to do our system, depending on how many um, employees and what labor force you committed to it. But that being said, you still have to cut those areas. You still have to send crews in when something is found. So that pulls away from the cycle-based approach. So with these increased, uh, with these remote sensing tools, excuse me, you're able to have that situational awareness in as close to real time as is possible right now. I think looking towards the future, these technologies will only get better. These technologies, I don't wanna say that they are going to be 100% the answer, but they are tools. And I really feel like because of these, we are moving away from a cycle-based approach and moving closer to, or more what I have liked to call data-driven. I've, I've used uh, risk-based in the past. And when you use risk-based, it seems like a lot of people start to lose their minds a little bit. So data-driven is a little more helpful in, from my perspective. Um, and using these remote sensing tools and sending them through an, with AI capabilities, sending them through the algorithms, they're able to really spit out and show us where we need to go, where we need to focus, where we can be most efficient. <clears throat> now, LiDAR has always been the Cadillac version of remote sensing. The drawbacks to LiDAR is it's always been very expensive. Um, primarily, it's been used on transmission infrastructure, but now because of the risk, of wildfire that we are facing, we're starting to look at LIDAR onto our distribution systems. It also does take time, although it is a lot faster. It takes time to fly a drone. It takes time to run a ground-based LIDAR unit out through all of the easements and all of the, the right-of-way. Coming back, you have to find a place for all that data. You have to crunch the data to get your situational awareness. <clears throat> We've also started really reaching out into partnerships with state, local, and federal government entities. That as the wildland urban interface increases, we have taken on partnerships to be able to clear a lot of these areas and these right-of-ways to really help with public safety. I mean, the last thing anyone wants is 
for a wildfire to start. First of all, you don't want any loss of life. Secondly, you don't want any loss of property. Thirdly, we like our forests and we want to keep them. <clears throat> we also, I mean, basically we, we're increasing the number of men in the field. We're increasing our labor force. We're increasing our manpower. And it's something that is very, very necessary. I mean, I've always, I've always tongue in cheek talked about the utility vegetation management industry as the redheaded stepchild of utilities. I mean, let's face it. We don't add to the bottom line. We actually take away from the bottom line. It is a necessary maintenance that has to happen. So it's been, funding in the past has been difficult and it still is difficult today. But I think a lot of what is going on in the country, especially in the West and globally for that matter, has really brought utility vegetation management to the forefront of people's minds. So now that has led itself to a lot of these advances in technology. <clears throat> um, we There's also been a lot of efficiency increases in uh, trimming equipment. There are buckets with articulating hydraulic saw heads. This helps cut back on the labor force some. You can do more work with less labor, with less boots in the field. <clears throat> now, the difference, what I have really kind of been struggling with, and I don't know if struggling is the right word, what I've been looking towards is if we move towards a more 100% data-driven cycle, in my mind, that is a very reactive approach. And that might be where, we at, where we're at right now. It might be triage in the battlefield. We have to do, we have to do. We have to really go out and find these areas using these tools and treat these areas in a timely manner. Is that sustainable for the future? I'm not sure. I, I don't think it is. I think it's where we are right now and it's what we have to do. I think my vision for the future, if I had to have one, would be that we would meld the two, cycle-based and data-driven in some manner. Because let's face it, you still have to treat 100% of the system over the course of that cycle. If you're only chasing the high-risk spans, and letting the lower wristbands grow up to become high wristbands before you send crews out to treat them. Like I said, that's reactive in my mind. So really looking at it is sending crews out to be able to adjust and find these areas first and foremost, and then working back based on the cycle approach in that given year's cycle, maybe where we end up in the future. Kind of finishing up, one thing I really want to uh, talk about is we still need the labor force out there. These are all tools. They are great tools, but they are just tools to help us manage and mitigate to, to reduce the risk of fire in our infrastructure and in our urban and rural forests. So I, I really think we need to keep that forefront on our mind. The labor shortage that we're seeing in the utility arborist industry is evident, probably even growing faster than the labor shortages all around the country and all globally for that matter. So Dennis can probably speak to this more, but he has done a lot of work with the UAA to, to really bring out into the world, hey, this is a viable career. This is something that you can start at, you can work through, and you can retire. So using these tools, but we also still need the people out in the field. And that's kind of where we are in current events right now, as far as the, my cooperative standpoint and the utility industry as a whole. <clears throat>